We've been uh, using during this Advent season as we're approaching the celebration of the birth of Christ, uh, the truth of scripture found in some specific Christmas hymns and carols to guide our focus. Uh, two weeks ago, we looked at the hymn, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, and considered the promise of Isaiah that a virgin would conceive and bear a son, and they would call his name Emmanuel. That prophecy was made 700 years before the birth of Jesus Christ, who fulfilled that promise. Last week, we considered the incarnation that in the birth of Jesus, God took on humanity and became one of us, and we did that through a hymn by Charles Wesley, Hark, the Herald Angels Sing. And if you remember that second verse, he writes, Veiled in flesh, the Godhead see, hail the incarnate deity, pleased as man with men to dwell, Jesus, our Emmanuel. And today we're going to think through another truth that explores the question, why did God become a human being? Did Jesus lay down the glory that he shared with the Father simply to come to give us a God sighting? Was his purpose in coming to earth little more than just a publicity tour of the divine? Now I'm deliberately being a little satirical because the Bible clearly teaches that Jesus came with a purpose. Broadly speaking, that purpose was to do the Father's will. But specifically, that purpose was to be the Savior of the world. The mission of Jesus was salvation. And the hymn we're going to use as the basis for our thinking is what the ensemble began our worship time together with. What child is this? Written well over 150 years ago by William Chatterton Dix. William Dix was born in Bristol, England. His father, a surgeon, had also written a biography of the poet Thomas Chatterson, which accounts why his son got that middle name. It also revealed his father's affection for poetry, something he also passed on to his son. As a young man, William moved to Glasgow, Scotland, and he pursued a career managing a marine insurance company, but his passion was poetry. He was greatly enticed by traditional English folk songs. And so when he started writing the lyrics for What Child Is This?, he decided to utilize the melody that you may recognize as green sleeves to create the carol. In 1865, William was 29 years old when he suffered from a near-fatal bout of sickness that not only resulted in him being bedridden, but also suffering from a severe depression. But this near-death experience really changed him. And while undergoing this recovery, he experienced a a renewal in his heart and a spiritual awakening, and he really started to grow as a true man of faith. He became an avid reader of the Bible and devoted much of his later poetry to Christian themes, and he also started writing hymns, including the lyrics of What Child Is This?, which is derived from a longer poem of his called The Manger Throne. Now, the context of this song is the passage that Peter read for us just a few moments ago from Luke chapter 2, and it centers around the shepherds who, once they received the angelic announcement, went to Bethlehem to find Mary and Joseph and the baby Jesus. The questions in the lyrics reflect what the shepherds may have been thinking to themselves when they encountered Jesus, and then the rest of the carol provides response to their questions. So again in the first verse, what child is this who laid to rest on Mary's lap is sleeping, whom angels greet with anthems sweet while shepherds watch her keeping. This, this is Christ the King, whom shepherds guard and angels sing, haste, haste to bring him laud, the babe, the son of Mary. Notice the question and answer, who is this child? He is Christ the King. Now it is the second verse that I want to focus on this morning. Now, the second verse in our hymn book uh, says, Why lies he in such mean a state where ox and ass are feeding? Good Christian fear, for sinners here the silent word is pleading. What does the phrase mean a state mean? Well, notice that Dix connects it with where ox and ass are feeding. 
mean estate in Old English was a way of referring to very unflattering, uncomfortable, and even uh, insulting circumstances into which Jesus was born. Notice that the Bible says that Mary laid him in a manger, and a manger was simply a feeding trough for animals that could be found either inside or outside of a stable. Remember, as Luke chapter 2 begins, we become aware of a census that was being passed throughout the land, and so people went to their, their father's towns, and people were coming to Bethlehem, and because of the overcrowding of Bethlehem, Due to those who had come to be registered for the census, lodging was scarce or perhaps even unavailable. So there was, the Bible says, no room for Mary and Joseph in the inn, which forced them to take refuge in the only place that they might find available, apparently a shelter for animals. Now, although the Bible never mentions that there are animals present at the birth of Christ, Jesus was laid in a manger which does strongly imply the presence of animals. And after all, what kind of nativity set would we have if we couldn't throw a few angel, uh, animals in there? The point that both the Bible and William Dix make is that Jesus the King was not born in a palace, not with extravagant surroundings, which certainly would have been fitting for a king, but instead he was born into poor and humble circumstances. Jesus was born in mean estate. And then Dix tells us the reason for Christ's mean estate in the second half of verse 2, which is not in the Baptist hymnal. Our hymnal has, Why lies he in such mean estate where ox and ass are feeding? Good Christians fear, for sinners hear the silent word is pleading. And then he adds the chorus that we sing each time. This, this is Christ the King, whom shepherds guard and angels sing, haste, haste to bring him laud, the babe, the son of Mary. Now here's what Dix actually wrote in the second verse. Why lies he in such mean estate where ox and ass are feeding? Good Christian fear, for sinners hear the silent word is pleading, nails, spear, shall pierce him through the cross he bore. For me, for you. Hail, hail the Word made flesh, the babe, the Son of Mary. Why this part of the second verse does not appear in our hymn book, I do not know. But the original text answers the question why Jesus came to earth, why he took on humanity, and that was to provide salvation for the whole world. Christ's mean estate was not just about being born in a manger, but it was also about coming to be the Savior. From a passage that we looked at very recently, the Apostle Paul reminds us that Jesus emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. Now listen, even death on a cross. You see, it's safe to leave Jesus as a baby in the manger. That version of Christmas is sweet and it's sentimental. It pulls at our heartstrings. It makes us feel good. You know, the traditional manger crutch or nativity set depicts a nice, non-threatening Christmas that we get to enjoy. And then when Christmas was over, we can wrap it up, store it away, and then pull it out again next year to enjoy but when you realize that baby Jesus is going to grow into a man and he's going to exchange swaddling clothes for a crown of thorns, he's going to leave the manger for a cross where he's going to suffer and die, it isn't so sweet and sentimental anymore. I mean, who wants a version of Christmas like that? But that's why Jesus came. The silent word pleading for the salvation of sinners. So let's consider quickly first about it. Salvation explains the identity of Jesus. The manager in a large office noticed a new employee, and he asked him, what's your name? And the worker said, John. And the manager scowled and said, look, I don't know where you worked before, but I don't call anyone by their first names. It breeds familiarity, and it leads to a breakdown in authority. I refer to my employees by their last name only. Smith, Jones, Baker. Got it? 
I'm going to be referred to as Mr. Robertson. Now that we've got that straightened out, what's your last name? Darling, my name is John Darling. <laughs> to which the boss replied, it's nice to meet you, John. <laughs> when the angel Gabriel came to Joseph, who was considering divorcing Mary because she was pregnant, and he knew the child wasn't his, Gabriel said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for that which is, con is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you will call his name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Now, I imagine that had they been given the chance, Joseph and Mary could have and would have named Jesus any name they chose, but they weren't given that chance. They were told to name him Jesus. Jesus is the, the English transliteration of the Greek uh, uh, Jesus, which is in the translation of the Hebrew name Yehoshua or, or Yahshua, which means Yahweh saves. The Son of God was given the name Jesus because it identifies who he is. He is the God who saves. In the Old Testament from the prophet Isaiah, God says, I, even I am the Lord, and there is no Savior besides me. In Hosea, yet I have been the Lord your God since the land of Egypt, and you were not to know any God except me, for there is no Savior beside me. In his first epistle, John says, but we have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. In Titus, Paul says, For we also once were foolish ourselves, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful, hurting one another. But when the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. In fact, in Acts chapter 5, uh, in, a, in a message, it says, The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you had put to death by hanging him on a cross. He is the one whom God exalted to his right hand as a prince and a savior to grant repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Isn't it ironic that the name which is so routinely today profaned is the only name by which a person can be saved? And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Let me go back to that Philippians 2 passage again, where in response to Christ becoming a human being, Paul writes, For this reason God highly exalted him, and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, at the name of Yahshua, at the name of God saves, every knee will bow. Of those who are in heaven and on the earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. See, salvation explains the identity of who Jesus is, and salvation encompasses the mission of Jesus. You shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Jesus did not come to earth to begin a movement, or to start a faith, or to found a religion. In a sermon, James Merritt wrote, Many Jewish people now see Jesus as a great teacher and a political performer, but nothing more. Hindus have come to revere Jesus as a self-realized saint, who has reached the highest level of God consciousness. Buddhists see him as a perfectly enlightened being, full of compassion, who helps other people. But none of the world's religions see him as Christians see him. To recognize Jesus simply as a man, a Jewish rabbi who traveled throughout Israel teaching and preaching about God and who even reportedly healed some people and did some miracles seriously fails to comprehend Jesus and his mission. Jesus had a mission, and that mission was salvation. His missiology is stated in his own words, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which is lost. Jesus healed people. 
but that wasn't his primary mission. He performed miracles, but that was not his primary mission. He even raised people from the dead, but that was not his primary mission. His mission was to call sinners to repentance, to give his life a ransom for many. And no matter whom Jesus encountered, whether it was a seeking teacher of the law wanting answers, a Samaritan woman who had been married five times and living with her coin current boyfriend, a rich young ruler, or even a woman caught in the act of adultery, our Lord's concern, regardless of their circumstances, was the salvation of their soul. Good Christian fear, for sinners hear the silent word is pleading. Nails, spears shall pierce him through, the cross he bore for me, for you. I was intrigued by the phrase, for sinners here, the silent word is pleading. Now, Dix apparently is making a reference back to the beginning of John's gospel. And again, these are very familiar verses for most of us. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The word points to Christ's pre-existent state. Well, what is meant for sinners hear the silent word is pleading? From what follows, we know that Dix is connecting that phrase to the cross because he says, nails, spears shall pierce him through the cross he bore for me, for you. Now, it might be that Dix is drawing from Isaiah 53 which in my opinion is one of the most powerful messianic chapters in the scripture. Isaiah writes, Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening of our well-being fell on him, and by his scourging we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've each one turned to our own way. But God has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to slaughter and like a sheep that is silent before it shears, so he did not open his mouth. I also wonder if Dix was thinking about perhaps the first of the seven words that Jesus uttered while he was on the cross. Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. The silent word is pleading. Salvation explains the identity of Jesus. Salvation encompasses the mission of Jesus. And salvation expresses the love of God in Jesus. One of the songs, simple songs, that we teach children to sing is, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, and he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. The Apostle Paul wrote, I have been crucified with Christ. And it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me, and the life that I now live in the flesh I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Walk in love, just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us an offering and sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. Jesus told his own disciples, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you love one another. Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love." The scripture is absolutely clear that what Jesus did on the cross in securing the salvation of the world is an evidence of his love for us all, for all of us and for each of us. Listen, if you ever have a moment in your spiritual journey where you question or doubt God's love for you, you need look no further than the cross, which screams, I love you. But can I point something else out? Perhaps one of the most well-known verses in the Bible is John 3, 16. In fact, if you know it, let's say it together right now. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son 
that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Now, we start our kindergartners on that verse in Awana. And when I'm listening to an, a, a kindergartner or first grader quote this verse, I will sometimes ask them what the word world means, for God so loved the world. And by the way, it is a word that emphasizes more than physical geography and more about physical condition or spiritual condition or lostness. In fact, you probably could paraphrase, paraphrase the verse to read, for God so loved lost people that he gave his only begotten son. But when I ask children, what does the word world mean? Sometimes I get little puzzled faces. And so I say, tell you what, let's just put your name in its place. For God so loved Billy or Susie or Johnny or Jimmy or Amy that he gave his only son. And, and usually they, they laugh, they smile, because now it's become very personal. But I'm trying to help them understand. For God so loved, go ahead, insert your name right there, right now. For God so loved you that he gave his only begotten son that if you believe in him, you will not perish but have eternal life. I have known this verse for a long, long time. But something struck me not too long ago. I'm not sure that I've seen before. I know that Jesus loves me. And I'm grateful for his love. But this verse says, God so loved the world. He gave his only begotten son. And maybe it's just a different way of looking at it, but it hit me that it's God's love, the Father's love for the world that caused him to see Jesus. The Bible says that God demonstrates his love to us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. John 3, 17 says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world or judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Yes, Jesus' love for us and the ultimate demonstration of his love was his death on the cross where he willingly gave his life to pay for the penalty of our sin. But his mission of salvation was also the mission of the Father who had sent him. Jesus said, For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of my, him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that all that he has given me I lose nothing but raise it up on the last day. Jesus did nothing or taught nothing, independent from the Father's mission, and that mission was the redemption of the human race. Listen, there is no greater missionary than God. The Apostle John wrote, We have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. And by the way, Jesus was the Savior of the world before there was a world. Peter writes, Knowing that you are not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood. As a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. For he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times for the sake of you. And his final stanza, William Dix, expands the circle of those attending the, this humble scene and drawing from the epiphany season and the gifts brought by the Magi. He invites all of us to come and to play by the manger, and to bring our metaphorical gifts of frankincense, gold, and myrrh. Third verse says, So bring him incense, gold, and myrrh. Come peasant king to own him. The king of kings salvation brings. Let loving hearts enthrone him. I love the fact that the invitation is here is to everybody, whether peasant or king. It's an invitation that defied conventional class structures of the time, yet it's also an affirmation that salvation is for everyone. The angelic message from the text that Peter read for us earlier was, I have good news of great joy, which shall be for all of the people. And the Bible says the Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but he is patient toward you, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. How many of you are familiar with the Four Spiritual Laws booklet? Anybody? A few of you? Okay. It was written by Dr. Bill Bright, the founder of Campus Crusade, now Crew, and it was uh, written all the way back in 1952. 
it be, booklet begins stating that just as there are physical laws that govern the physical universe, so there are spiritual laws that govern your relationship with God. And then it proceeds to give a gospel presentation. And then towards the end, there is a kind of a summary diagram. John, uh, uh, oh, I, I have a clicker, don't I? Somewhere. John, could you just bring that up for me? There you go. I hope you can see that. I know it's a little fuzzy. But the, the booklet asks, of course, there's, there's two possibilities. It says, who is on the throne is the first. And then the one underneath is Christ is on the throne. And it's just a visual way of depicting who is on the throne of your life. And in the first case, uh, uh, you were on the throne. And Jesus, he's, he's outside. He's not having an influ influence in our life. Uh, and then in the second one, Jesus is on the throne of our lives. Uh, the book asks the question, which circle best describes your life? Which circle would you like to have represent your life? Dix wrote, the king of king salvation brings. Let loving hearts enthrone him. Let me ask you something. Is Jesus enthroned on your heart? Is he sitting on the rightful place of the throne of your life? If not, then you can make him Lord of your life right now. How do you do that? Well, in Four Spiritual Laws booklet, there is this invitation. You can receive Christ right now by faith through prayer. Prayer is talking to God. God knows your heart, and he's not so concerned about your words as he is the attitude of your heart. So here's a following suggested prayer, and I'm just going to ask you if, if you'll join me as, uh, as I pray this. Lord Jesus, I need you. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. I open the door of my life, and I receive you as my Savior and Lord. Thank you for forgiving my sins and giving me eternal life. Take control of the throne of my life and make me the kind of person you want me to be. Well, if that prayer expresses the desire of your heart, I hope you prayed it. Because if you did, the promise of Jesus is that Christ will come into your life as he promised. The song ends with these last two sentences. Joy, joy, for Christ is born, the babe, the son of Mary.